and not come out of the facial. And this is the same holds true for those posterior implants. So this is why, again, it is so critical to keep those teeth within your surgical template. Next item up, again, is how much bone do we need to remove? Well, as you'll notice here, we have a mark at 18 millimeters. The surgeon knows how much he needs to remove, and so we're now playing a sure game. Same holds true with this, this type of patient. This is a, a severely atrophied uh, maxilla. This is Dr. Luis Codina, one of our classmates from the University of Washington, phenomenal clinician. He's doing quad zygomas, and the same deal here. He's utilizing this type of template to ensure that the timing of those SRAs is appropriate. So even in a case that has so much atrophy, we're utilizing the same concept, same type two or class two surgical template. Okay? We move along and we go to guide number three. This is a restrictive, fully guided, flapless guide. And it's really cool for those patients where, you know, they're systemically, I guess, compromised. You don't want it. You want to do a very conservative surgery. Uh, the patient has already gone through bone remodeling, so you don't need to cut the bone away. So it's a very, very minimally invasive surgery. So it's tissue supported, bone anchored, and it provides for dimensional information. So here you see how we're, again, duplicating the denture to get fiduciary markers. We plan our surgery through our uh, software, and we see that while we're really, really tight, we can still be able to place some implants. And again, this becomes a, a very straightforward protocol for these types of patients. And again, tomorrow, we're going to be walking you through a ton of these clinical examples. So the implants go in, and we're good to go. And last but not least, the uh, smile-in-a-box type, the stackable systems, the restrictive, fully guided open flap. This is like the Rolls-Royce of the, of the surgical templates because it really allows us to go in a linear fashion through bone reduction, implant placement, um, and the coolest thing is also a pickup of the provisional, as, as we will see that it may become, or it, it, it's tricky sometimes and it's challenging. So the reality is that these guys are bone supported, bone anchored, they allow for bone reduction, for dimensional placement of the implant, and the provisional pickup. And I'm just here throwing, um, you know, the, a visual essay, if you will, of the surgery. Tomorrow we're going to walk you, you know, uh, through each one of the steps so that you understand exactly what are the implications of each one. But for now, I wanted just to, to uh, brief you into the different types of surgical templates and why is one preferred to the other depending on the different conditions. So I know this is a very busy slide. Tomorrow you'll have a very clear idea of, of what each one of all these pictures represents. Now, the key, though, when we talk about surgical templates is that none of them is absolutely perfect. These are templates. These are guides, which means that there are surgical calls that you'll need to do during surgery. You'll realize, for a number of reasons, that which, whatever it was that you planned for implant placement position, you may modify it a little bit, which right there tells you that uh, if you have a very... Uh, restrictive guide, sometimes you'll end up modifying your very restrictive guide. But going through the exercise of knowing exactly what you want will allow you to be as close as the bullseye as possible. But again, I, I, I want to let you all very, very clearly that none of these are perfect. Uh, and, and sometimes, transsurgically, you have to assess and verify and make your surgical decisions as I will show you shortly. Now, let's integrate all this now. Now that we have your initial piece, your classification, your framework, you have the type of prosthesis that you want to do, either fixed, fixed, hybrid, or removable, and you figure out which type of surgical template, now let's walk through this so-called restorative roadmap, which are those four elements in the right, okay? This right here, which is an integral part of your thought process. So number one, 
system selection, number two, loading protocol, number three, type of provisional, number four, prosthetic components. So start with system. And for the sake of nomenclature, we're calling tissue level, only Strawman has tissue level, bone level, every other company has bone level implants. Um, but the reason why we're, we're essentially talking about tissue level, as I'll, I'll show you tomorrow, it's a perfectly valid system to do fixed hybrids. There are nuances that you need to see, uh, and essentially you'll notice here with these tissue level uh, implants placed on example number one, look at that AP spread. Look at that beautiful AP spread. In order to get that AP spread, what did we need to have? We need to have the right ridge configuration. And again, tomorrow we're going to be talking about ridge configuration. So, what are the characteristics for tissue level? Well, of course, because we're going fixture level, no abutment, but we're going to the fixture, we need to have parallel implants. Here we cannot angle implants, okay? We're going to the implant platform. We're not placing abutments. And there's very clear advantages to go straight to the implant and avoid going to uh, an abutment connection. We'll talk about this tomorrow. And the main advantage is less components, less cost. When we're talking about bone level um, systems, we need to have uh, visible access. We have to correct the angulation. It's fundamental to understand the importance of correcting angulation. And of course, there are more components. So there are very clear advantages, but there are very clear indications of why you choose one system versus the other. And again, tomorrow we're going to nail all these areas. So we spoke about the tilting of the implants. If you're tilting implants, you have no choice other than to go bone level and correct with components, as I'll show you momentarily. Next concept regarding our restorative roadmap, which has to do with the loading protocol. Are we doing immediate loading or are we doing delayed loading protocols? Tomorrow we're going to be talking very heavily on immediate loading, but I'll, I'll jumpstart you with this concept. Immediate loading every day, but not for every patient. So what are the nuances? What are the reasons behind staying away from immediate loading? We're going to be talking about that tomorrow morning. But these are two different protocols that we all need to understand and all need to be ready uh, to do. Last but not least, no, actually, no, the, the third concept is the type of provisional or the restorative part, which is provisional restoration and prosthetic components. So when we're talking about provisionals, in these types of patients, we have three different types of potential provisionals. We can have a pre-existing denture. Right? The patient comes in with a pre-existing denture, and if things look okay, we could utilize that as a provisional. We could do a new set of dentures, or we could do new provisionals with chart CAD CAM generated for these stackable systems that we'll be seeing shortly. And last but not least, we're going now for prosthetic components. So you may choose to go fixture level, and again, you can do fixture level when you're when you are dealing with tissue level implants, or in fact, you may choose to go fixture level for bone level implants as well, provided those implants are parallel. Or you may choose to go abutment level, either when they're straight or when they're angled, and we have different heights and different angulations, as I told you before. So we're diving into that specifically case after case after case tomorrow morning. But if you take a look at these three examples, you'll notice example number one, we're going fixture level on one system. Picture number two, we've got abutment level, SRA abutments already, all ready to go for screw retention. Patient number three, we're going bone level with a different system. And here you can see again, this picture with those SRAs or th those components where we're already angling, correcting the angulations and being able to screw retain this prosthesis. So again, that's kind of like the restorative roadmap. So with all this in mind, let's all treatment plan our last patient of today and set you up for Q&A. Uh, but let's just 
walk through this case so that you know how much you've learned today. And remember, uh, when you have that little icon, it means this patient is a study club module. This is Fred, if you want to look him up and if you want to discuss his case with your study club. So Fred comes to us. Um, he's no stranger to dentistry. He's been fully restored in the past. In fact, he was restored overseas by somebody that claims to be a basal implantologist. Um, here's Fred depicting. You see how we're looking at the way he's smiling, taking different pictures. We want to assess how much that lip may travel. Close-up view of his smile. And this is what we get as Fred smiles, full-blown smile. So you see there's a lot of disease, a lot of um, attachment loss. Teeth are pretty mobile. This is what things look like in these bite wings. Occlusal shots, and you start seeing something that looks like an implant right there in the palate. As we look at uh, this clinical image, you'll, you'll notice how you know, teeth are moving on him. And this is the, the x-ray. This is what refers to the, those basal implants, I guess. And those long implants in the back and the maxillary are pterygoid implants. And those propellers are from a boat. <laughs> um, and so you'll see the amount of disease that we have. So, show of hands, if Fred comes to your office, who would refer Fred? Okay, you're not referring Fred. You're the only choice Fred has. <laughs> no, you're not shooting yourself. What's your name? Rick. Rick. That's a great name, Rick. Can I call you Ricardo like me? <laughs> Perfect. So Rick, you cannot let me down. You and I are going to treatment plan this case from start to finish. Do you all agree that Rick's going to do it? Yes? yes? Okay, he's not going to do it by himself, though. We're all going to be helping Rick. But you'll see, Rick, why this is a slam dunk case for you. I can assure you. Let me just spice it up a bit for you before I... So the fact that we see more disease, Rick, shouldn't scare us. It should facilitate the process. Now, let's start by defining the concept of complexity, because this is a complex case. But in fairness, if we look at complexity as, you know, a number of intricate parts that are interconnected uh, and mutually related, so long as we look at all these intricate parts, they become simple parts that are interconnected. So we can work, ar work around those parts. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing, Rick. So this morning we talked about pattern recognition. Right? And we showed these, these beautiful people. And we showed them from different angles. So it's just a matter of looking at these patterns, and you'll see, Rick, how straightforward fixing Fred really is. Because of all the cases that I could show you, Fred probably is among the most straight, straightforward cases. And you know how much you've learned. Let's walk through our framework. So Rick, let's start with location. Is Fred MX, MN, or M&M? &M? You bet, buddy. Uh, we're going to go through. Is, would, would you agree that he has terminal dentition? Yes. Actually, you know what? Let's do this. Let's do this. Oops. Take a good look. Remember our algorithm to see whether to remain, to leave teeth, or to extract. Here's our algorithm. Do you feel he has enough perio damage or structural damage to be terminal? Yes. Does anybody uh, have a problem with this? Do you all agree? Okay. So then we all agree we're extracting. We all agree Fred is terminal opposing terminal. Yes? Check. Nobody's got any qualms about this. Fred goes for a second opinion. You're, gonna, you're not going to go, yeah, I'll save those canines. Right? Awesome. Okay, Rick. Etiology. 
EFSB, what's the main risk that Fred has? The reason why we're extracting teeth. Periodontal, right? And also, some, to, to, some, to some degree, take a look, I'll show you again. Oops. Okay. So, structural and biologic, right? Yes? If we're losing teeth, and you saw already the pattern, is he a LTR class one? There's no way, there's gotta be some pink, right? So most likely he's gonna be a class two. Most likely. I mean, once we remove the teeth, we'll, we'll reassess, but most likely he seems to be a class two. Everybody okay with this clinical assessment? Okay. So personally, I'll tell you, from a compliance standpoint, he's the best patient ever. He's super happy to come to practice and, and to come, you know, on time to all his appointments. And he's got a ton of money. The dream patient. Now, let me walk you, or let, let's, let's fill out this form, you and I, Rick. Okay? And by the way, this form is in the back of your handout. So, let's help Rick here. Patient's name? Who, who, who heard his name? Fred. F, as, and you know why Fred is not his real name. We call him Fred F, because he's carbon copy to Fred Flintstone. <laughs> Patient desires fixed or removable. He wants fixed. So the interdisciplinary team, the restorative, it's GD Boscas, which is our, our team, but the reality is no, we're going to change that and I'm going to put Dr. Rick. The surgical aspects will be done by Dr. Suarez. The technician for this case is going to be Domenico Cassioni. And now we go for location. So we said we're going to be treating both M&Ms. It is a terminal dentition arch or arches. Next question, the existing tooth position. Remember, it's, it's a critical aspect to figure out what's the story here. Is it adequate or inadequate? I'm going to show you again. If I were to ask you to give me one reference that you're gonna, which tooth would, would you use as a reference for tooth position? And remember this morning we talked about incisal plane, occlusal plane. Which, which tooth do you like, Rick? Nine. All right, number nine. Or number eight. The reality is we're both right. I mean, number eight or number nine has a millimeter of, of discrepancy. But we utilize one as a reference. So we, I'll tell you why we chose number eight. When in doubt, I'd rather have a longer tooth because it's always easier to remove a bit. Uh, but I would agree that perhaps the end result would be eight, eight-ish. Let's, let's do 8.5. 8 How's that? <laughs> okay? Use number eight as a reference. Okay? Etiology. You already went through this, and we're talking... There's structural damage, but you better believe there's a much bigger X in biology. Everybody good, good with this? Yeah? Okay. Move along. LTR classification. We said he seems to be a class two. We don't quite know, but he seems to be living here once we remove the teeth. Right? But you'll notice that I'm not categorically saying, yeah, he's a class two. We get, we're going to have to reassess. So we go back and say, okay, he seems to be a class two. Is he, is he at risk aesthetically? You saw his picture, like full bone smile. Do you think he is going to be showing a lot of tissue? Do you think his lip mobility is going to be an issue? Well, I don't think so either. His desired restoration, is it fixed? Fixed hybrid? Fixed full arch? He wants the best available, so we're going... With more than four implants, we're going ceramics, okay? So, we go through the next step, prosthetic space evaluation. Do you think we need to subtract vertically at all? No. You see how Rick is scoring a perfect 10? He didn't want to take the patient. He was just being uh, too cautious. That's exactly what I don't want you to be. You can do it. You see how, you see how easy it is? So yeah, vertical space, you don't need to subtract anything. Rick, are we doing sequential extractions? No. Well, I'm going to ask you again. Do 
do you think, do you see any value in keeping any of these teeth, um, you know, to do sequential? And the reality is, I would agree with you. I mean, you can be a super heroic saying, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll save some teeth, and what you're going to en end up doing is, you know, just increasing, you know, um, treatment time. It's going to be a liability. You're going to end up extracting those teeth. The reality is it's not worth it. So sequential extractions, no. Are we doing immediate dentures for Fred? The answer is ideally yes. Are we doing immediate placement? In other words, removing the teeth and placing implants. And I'm going to say no because what, what we want to teach you guys is to play a safe game. Listen, in real life out there, there's a bunch of colleagues that would see Fred they would remove the disease, they would place the implants, everything one shot. And the reality is, is, is that um, compromising therapy? I couldn't say it is. But to me, the most important thing is, you know, to think about the case long term. How do we play a safe game? And so the reality is, we could do immediate loading once those ridges are healed. For me, there's a lot of disease. There's suppuration. I, wanna, I want that to, stay, to, to, to go away. I want to make sure that we're now working in a very healed environment. Last but not least, the conversion. Who's doing the conversion? Are we doing it, Rick, or are we sending, or is the lab going to be doing it? You bet you're going to be doing it, my friend. Awesome. So, system that we're utilizing. For Fred, we're going for Strawman BLT, bone level tapered. How about distribution? So it seems like we're going for six implants in each arch. We need to have, you know, uh, CBCT imaging, and it seems like we're going to be utilizing surgical guides, type 2 guides. So again, we go back to what we already know, tooth position, FGTP. We got to see his face, and then we decide we're going for 8.5 or somewhere between the two centrals, right? So straightforward as it is, we're gonna go ahead and make some impressions. Be careful because uh, especially tooth number eight is really, really uh, mobile. And so we're able to uh, make the impressions. And here we're just drawing some lines to assess where ideally we'd want the teeth to be. Make some conventional impressions and from these we generate some immediate dentures, right? So now, Rick, let's talk about our surgical goals for this first surgery. Are we doing extractions? Are we doing bone reduction? Are we doing implant placement? Are we doing bone, re uh, bone graft? We are? Probably not. Soft graft? Soft tissue graft? No. For this first surgery, we're only doing extractions. Yeah. You know, I, I, I would agree that they're going to leave a defect, but ideally for those cases, you remove, you clean it up, and then you assess, and then you place the graft once you place the implants. Surgeons, do, would you agree with me? Surgeons in the house, would you agree? Okay. And again, that's a surgical call. Some may choose to graft at the same time. I feel way more comfortable, you know. It's a, just a much cleaner graft that way. So the type of provision we're utilizing when doing a new denture. Right, Rick? Awesome. So sure enough, take a look at those teeth. I mean, come on, they're, they're out. We remove them, and here's the hardware. Again, you can do a donation to the Smithsonian if you want. Um, and sure enough, now you just deliver those immediates. Put some conditioner, sub-tissue conditioner, and you let those ridges heal. So far, so good, Rick? Yes, sir. Right? So you see now how those ridges are healing, healing nicely. And Fred, of course, is compliant enough to understand and see the value of waiting, of going through a, you know, a removal phase, which is a discussion we need to have with our patients. Be very, and tomorrow we'll talk about this. Be very careful being talked into not going through this phase when you feel it's the best thing that can happen to the patient. Now, we've been talking about pattern recognition. Rick, this is a very, very important question. What do you see when you see these ridges? What do you see? This is critical for treatment. Lumpy. What else do you see? 
Guys, pattern recognition. Who sees the Batman? <laughs> so you see two ridges that are healing, right? Okay. They heal, and now we got to reassess. So remember we said we're not too sure if he's a class two, class three or four. What do we need to do? Remember, we need to go for a flagless try-in. We do a duplicate of the denture, we remove the flange, and we assess lip support. And once we do this, we know, sure enough, that he pretty much lives within the class two. If he wants fixed, we can give him fixed. And we assess this through this image where we see lip support. Okay? So now that you have all this information, if you wanted to go to the 18 millimeter and do a uh, fixed hybrid for, for dimensions, you see what you would still need to remove a lot of bone. So because we're doing an, an implant-supported fixed dental prosthesis, we don't need to remove bone at all. We're placing the implants three to four millimeters apical to the proposed gingival margin, just as if it was a single tooth. So we're going six on six. So which one of these restorative designs would say we're going to be choosing for Fred? The fixed guy, and we know it's going to be pink. So it's a, class, a classic class two with pink. Everybody okay with this? Yes? So Rick, let's walk these folks through our restorative roadmap. See how straightforward this is, buddy. Are we going, let's start with system selection, okay? Are we going tissue level or bone level? Awesome. Are we going for an immediate loading protocol or are we going for a delayed loading protocol? What's that? We decided immediate, but we have to realize that that, does, that can be a wish, but not necessarily a decision. So the reality is, you'll notice that we're going to end up loading the mandible, and we're going to end up delaying the load in the maxilla. This is all based on torque of insertion and it's based on surgical feeling, and we're going to be talking about that tomorrow. So uh, existing provisional, we have a pre-existing provisional. He's been wearing his denture for a while. Prosthetic components, are we going fixture level or abutment level? The reality is with him we could go either way, but if the implants are parallel, we could go fixture level. And this way we're saving components and money. Now, let's talk about our next surgical procedure and what are going to be now our uh, surgical goals. We've done the extractions. Are we doing bone reduction? Are we doing implant placement? Are we doing bone graft? Yeah. I think so. You bet. I think so, too. <coughs> you see how straightforward this is? How linear this process is? Type of guy that we're going to be utilizing? We're just duplicating what he has. So we're utilizing our type 2, non-restrictive open flap. Why is this guide pretty okay for, for a patient like Fred? It's going to provide axial orientation. The surgeon can go ahead, place the implants, and remember, we're leaving the palate as support. And go, don't get me wrong, we can go as fancy as you want. We can go with a CAD CAM generated guide, and tomorrow I'll show you examples. But I want, I want to make sure we show you each and every single example so you feel you've got the concept, and once you have the concept, you can do anything you want. So we place the implants in both arches. Place the implant and we close. Go to the mandible. We close, and then we go through a conversion protocol, and there we have a, um, you've got a QR code there. We, we've got a visual essay where we walk you through step by step of all the different aspects of a conversion of prostheses. So we'll talk about this at length tomorrow, but you'll notice what we're doing is, uh, the first thing is we utilize um, uh, bite registration, the blue moose. Uh, and we make sure that we get indentations of all, where the healing abutments are. Then we go ahead and make our perforations. And you will notice that we're leaving three um, elements, one anterior and two uh, where the retromolar pads are. What this is doing, it's going to stabilize our uh, lower denture during the reline protocol. We're going to try our temporary abutments, and again, this is done 
either the day of surgery or the day after surgery, and we'll talk about this tomorrow, we make sure that we open up the holes 360 so that the guide or the, 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 um, the denture is, is seated all the way where it should be. Then we're going to be doing is we're going to be outlining in some rubber dam, you know, the outline of our denture, and then we're going to be going um, and creating, you know, with a clamp, we're going to be now uh, perforating so that we can isolate uh, nicely for our pickup. The other thing that we need to do, and tomorrow we'll, we'll speak about this at large, is we need to pre-sandblast um, our temporary abutments, and ideally we should salt and pepper them, you know, uh, and we can, we can use all sorts of different materials. Tomorrow we're going to be talk, talking about newer materials that are incredibly effective, a bit more expensive, but incredibly effective. And so the key is to have a nicely isolated field. And more important than anything is we have to make sure that there's no saliva contamination. Now, we're going to be utilizing PMMA for this pickup, which is like the cheapest material. Uh, there, there are more sophisticated materials that you could utilize, like light-cured composites uh, or resins that are, that are phenomenal for pickup, and we're going to be talking about those materials tomorrow. But here we utilize PMMA. The key is Fred bites down all the way. He's good to go. We utilize a lot of water. We make sure we let that polymerize intraorally. And the key again here is, you see, we just bring... Uh, we, we unscrew, we remove this, and now we're going to be doing the conversion protocol, which means adding in those areas where we have concavities. We want to make sure that we have a nice, flat intaglio ridge. We trim it, and in it goes. Verifying radiographically that they're seated all the way, and you'll notice that the maxilla is staying unloaded. Three months down the road, maxilla is ready. And, and the reason why we didn't load it, we didn't have the right insertion uh, torque in all those implants. We did graft as well. The surgeon felt more comfortable just not loading it. Okay. Uncovery. And uh, I want to specifically show you this because this is something that I, I want you to be very careful about. We remove, um, you know, the soft tissue conditioner. Now we're ready to do the pickup or the conversion. Same deal, do the conversion, do the pickup, remove the pallet, and off we go. As we take a look at Fred aesthetically, what's going on with his teeth? What happened with his teeth? We intruded his teeth. We were not careful enough as we did the pickup. We removed all that material from the pallet when he bit down. He's a bit overclosed. Now, can we fix this? Sure we can. And I could have bypassed showing you this image, but for me, it's way more important for you to see what can go wrong and how to fix it. So what happened here, as I said, we removed all the pallet, and when we did the realign, um, we dropped the ball and he closed a bit too much. So you'll notice here that we lost his teeth. Now we need to recoup those teeth. So we're ready to go for the definitive. Rick. So what we're going to be doing, we're going to be making some impressions. A simple way of going about is just uh, doing a pickup of what he has. You just pour it up, just a pickup of what he has, you pour it up, and then you can do, from this, we can generate now a little prototype through which we can add some more length to make sure that now we've got the right tooth position relative to Fred's face. Okay? And once we're happy with, with the way this looks, now this goes to the lab. Now we can generate, you know, a true prototype of the definitive, and with some patients, you may choose to have them, like, more long-term with provisionals. With Fred, he was, like, six months with provisionals. Now, the key is, uh, you'll notice here that we have also, so you see what beautiful CAT CAM generated provisionals we're able to generate, how the soft tissue heals very nicely. Now we're pretty much done. All we need to do here is to make sure that we pick up that intaglio surface because we, 
we had some remodeling of the tissue, which, which is pretty common to happen. So we're going to be adding some composite to that so we make sure that we have a nice contact of the prosthesis, the intaglio uh, portion with the ridge, so it looks like so. And so we stabilize Fred here long term, well, six months. He's super happy, he's compliant, he's showing us you know, that he's keeping, it, keeping things really, really clean. And so we move forward whenever he feels that uh, we can move forward. It's, it's important to see sometimes with these patients, we start seeing that they start breaking provisionals. We've got to move faster, and we'll talk about this tomorrow. But Fred was a non-functional um, risk patient, so he did not do any harm to the provisional at all. And here you can notice, you know, how now we've got all the parameters nailed down in this particular picture. So pretty much from where we were to where we're at right now. Okay? Now... We're ready to, again, send this back to a lab. We have this duplicate in which we're picking up the intaglio, the soft tissue, so the technician can build the ceramic exactly to that configuration. So all it takes is for us to pick up with some GC pattern rest in those intaglio areas, and we're good to go. We can make a new open tray impression, and we can, we're going to be talking about impressions tomorrow. Some may choose to bypass this because they already had the information by just picking the provisional up and that's also valid. We're doing it the most orthodox way, so we're doing a new impression, but you don't really need to. And here's Domenico's beautiful work. You'll notice, you know, the minimal cutback he's doing, just the facial. Everything else is zirconia, and just layering, just the facial. Okay, both arches. And here you have the way the soft tissue looks after having provisionals for a long time, and you see how, what a good job Fred does with hygiene. And here's a prosthesis in place. Okay, radiographic verification. Hygiene instructions, you gotta make sure that they know exactly how to clean. You go in and you torque to 35 newton centimeters. And off Fred goes and we put him in a recall. Depending on what we see, we put him in a recall either every three to four months to six months. And it's a happy camper. So from here to here. So how did you guys think Rick do today treating this patient? That amazing. I owe it all to you. You don't. You owe it all to yourself. You, ha you had some help from your classmates, but you did awesome. So Recapping, and again, here's our, our, you know, our very busy slide that's got everything on it. We're going to go through some Q&A, but we, before we do so, we're going to say goodbye to the folks from Facebook, and I want to just leave you with this, one of my favorite quotes by Marcel Proust that says that the real voyage of discovery does not consist in seeing new landscapes, but in seeing new eyes you will realize that the Freds live in your practice. The Mary Joes live in your practice. All these patients that we've been talking and showing today live in your practice. Some of them you've, you've seen, some of, the, some of them you haven't embraced, the fact that all these elements live in your practice. So we're gonna do some Q&A and I'm hoping to send you, you know, home tonight. For, well, first of all, with a very well-deserved couple of glasses of wine. Um, we're going to be celebrating and having some, taking some pictures and hashtagging TTD Spear Seminar. Is that wine from me? Can I get it? Um, and uh, tomorrow, we're going to have a heavy-duty day two. <laughs>